Hello, I'm Lisa Lord, and in our news tonight, government and residents react to the U.S. travel advisory. The St. George Parish Church vandalized. An amendment to a bill debated in the Senate allowing for government to embrace technology to conduct its business. Local entrepreneurs set to meet with tech giants at a Caribbean summit. And in sports, WICB presidential candidate Ricky Skerritt takes aim at incumbent Dave Cameron at a fiery news conference. Broadcasting from our studios in the Pine St. Michael, this is CBC News Night, starting now. And in our news, the Attorney General is not overly worried about the most recent travel advisory issued by the United States State Department about Barbados. Dale Marshall tells CBC News there's a perception that a travel advisory is the same thing as a warning against travel, but that's far from the case. Lisa Broom has more. In a posting on its website dated March 5th under the Safety and Security tab, the State Department noted that most crime on the island is petty theft and street crime. But it also cautions that violent crime, including rape and armed robbery, does occur. And it issues routine warnings about not leaving valuables or hotel rooms or rental homes unsecured. And what the Attorney General points out is that the posting puts Barbados at level one, which is the lowest risk, while places like Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago and the UK are all rated level two. It is really a rating of uh, safety levels issued by the Americans. And it just asks Americans to exercise normal precautions. So it is, there's nothing to fear from it. Um, it is not an advisory against travel to Barbados. It is, it is a document issued by the U.S. which rates us at the lowest level of risk. Now, I have to say that we must not take comfort from the fact that we are rated at the lowest level of risk. We have some issues in Barbados that we have to attend to. The advisory identifies Crab Hill in St. Lucie, the Ivy in St. Michael, Nelson and Wellington Street in Bridgetown at night, as well as night cruises on the Jolly Roger and Buccaneer as do not travel areas. It has also suggested increased caution in Black Rock, Deacons, Carrington Village and New Orleans, one of the places identified by the police as crime hot spots. The U.S. isn't saying anything that we don't already know. And, and as I, I reiterate that Barbadians are encouraged to, to exercise normal um, precautions as, as they go about their business in Barbados. And there are areas in Barbados that have been identified by the Royal Barbados Police Force as being areas of instability. And we are working hard to try to correct those things. Uh, but we mustn't bury our head in the sand. There are hot spots in Barbados and those hotspots are, are areas where there's an increased level of criminal activity um, associated with them. Efforts to get a comment from tourism officials were unsuccessful. Lisa Broom, CBC News. Well, the residents from some of the areas that have been named in that U.S. travel advisory have been reacting to the news. Our Shane Jones went into the heart of those communities today and he's here now to give us a first-hand account of what they've been seeing. Good evening, Shane. Yes, Lisa, it was quite an interesting experience um, traveling into those areas this afternoon on that specific topic. Now, some people were reluctant to speak, as they told me. They really didn't want to publicly comment on the crime situation in their community. However, there were many who opened up to me, most in a strong defense of their community. A lot of them didn't actually know about the advisory, but I was able to update them about it, talking to them and explaining exactly what it meant and the different levels of precaution advised. I also used my cell phone to show them all of the areas that were highlighted. Now, Lisa, I selected three St. Michael areas that we see in the news a lot, and not always for the best reasons. The first one my photographer Chris Wood and I visited was in the Pine, and there was pretty much mixed reaction there. We got to take some responsibility, and things that are going on in Barbados, I don't like. Parents got to start being parents again, right? But also on the other end, we could we could we be in Barbados, now we could say that so we, we, people here in Barbados don't go to New York or don't go to Chicago. But look at the murder rate across here, so and stuff like that. That's what the people are basically about. It's a good, very big, nice place. I don't see nothing wrong going on in the point that should be 
this sort of way that you're telling people to don't come in your point. I don't know where the people from the states get this information from, but the point is one is nicest places that you could ever lime in. So that was the pine, some understanding, but also strong pushback against the advisory. Next, we travel to Nelson Street in the city, one of the areas that the advisory has cautioned against going at night. We had some interesting responses there. Anybody could come in Nelson Street. God, the things, if they hear something happening in Nelson Street, it don't be residents in Nelson Street. It's people that come from outside and do the things in Nelson Street, though. So I don't see why somebody will probably say, and so don't come in Nelson Street. In yeah, Nelson Street, people, all the murders and things that want to hear going on, nothing happening in Nelson Street. All over the place, not want to happen in Nelson Street. None. When I can see the culture, man, like, nice ladies, like, I say, man, the hand. Yeah, man, like, I don't know why, man, like, nice young boys like myself and a couple of my friends and, yeah, like, for real. That took an unexpected twist at the end there. And finally, we traveled to New Orleans. Now, what I got from the people I spoke to there was a sense of pride in the community and deep concern about the advisory. Well, the Americans can do whatever they feel like, but they don't have any problems in the Orleans. I, I, I fear for, for, for people to be living in some place. You understand? You speak in Bible, okay. When you go for jobs and you say that you're living in the Orleans, people go to different places. You understand? I work for people that live in the Orleans, man. As a resident of the Orleans, as someone who actually grew up down here, it made me feel bad because, you know, what happened in the Orleans too is not only the Orleans people alone. Yeah, it was so so coming in, but I mean, it don't sound good, honestly. Mm -hmm. as an audience person. So that pretty much sums it up, Lisa. People are defending their hometowns and basically expressing that they are hurt, that this is the way their communities are being viewed. Back to you, Lisa. Thank you so much, Shane. Always good to hear from the people. Well, a Barbados-based fintech company has signed a major deal that will change the way transactions are conducted in countries using the EC currency. That company, BIT, has partnered with the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank to issue the world's first blockchain-based digital currency. In an exclusive interview, the head of BIT, Senator Rodden Adams, explained what it all means. The is looking to reduce the use of cash by 50%, and by doing so, change the way business is done in the eight islands that use the EC currency. The chief executive officer of BIT, Senator Rodden Adams, says every what the ECCB in the is buy a is trying to do or cash out your Bitcoin on the spot, digital making it more convenient for you to process deposits and withdrawals here. What he says is a quantum leap in both growth and quality of life for the 630,000 people across those islands. This will be the first time a pilot of this type allows a central bank to issue a digital form of cash right down to the retail level, retail level being the consumer level. So you could have a smartphone app, a digital wallet if you like, that carries a digital version of the EC dollar and allows people to transact for goods and services at merchants. And it's also in the hands of uh, the financial sector banks can also participate. He says the pilot will seek to attack the very substantial costs associated with handling cash. In the Eastern Caribbean they spend about three and a half million dollars a year replacing physical note and coin. That encompasses things like the, the ordering of the notes, the transportation, the security around it, the distribution. It's an expensive undertaking and that's just at an operation level for the central bank. But lower down whether you're talking about a bank or merchant, they also face uh, fees and costs associated both with cash and the processing of payments around cards, debit and credit cards that are very substantial. As for those who have reservations about the security of the technology, Senator Adams says it is very safe. Fraud is ever present. This technology is very, very good for guaranteeing security, but any system, people are going to test it. So we're ready for that, and I, I think it's, it's good that you were weary, and it's good that people ask the questions, because it does test us and it makes us think carefully. The pilot, which starts this month, will be executed in two phases. One for development and testing, which will be followed by the rollout and implementation in pilot countries for six months. The ECCB plans to focus on sensitizing and educating the public about the technology. And we will have a little more on a bit later in the business report. 
Well, today is Ash Wednesday, which marks the start of the Lenten season, and Barbadians are being asked to give up negative things like gossip to help prevent conflicts which lead to crime and violence. And that plea from Rector of the St. David's Church, Canon Noel Burke, in his sermon at a special Ash Wednesday service. Canon Burke noted that many disagreements around the world are fostered by people saying negative things about each other. He also suggested that Barbadians must start to look within themselves in order to bring about change. Let it begin with the individual. And so we want to say to the young people, those of us who have young people in our care and charge, that we do not have to resort to violence in order to resolve the very petty issues that arise among us from time to time. But even within the context of our homes and our workspaces, our words and our attitudes. The government is taking steps to move into a modern framework embracing technology when it comes to government business. Minister of Information, Broadcasting and Public Affairs Senator Lucille Moe says it's time the country takes the step into the 21st century and recognize electronic application as a must. Senator Moe revealed there is no plan to get rid of the government printery, noting that they are moving to provide gazettes online. During debate on the Interpretation Amendment Bill 2019, she told the Upper House that outdated techniques are hampering the government's efforts to function efficiently. I think most places in the world now are moving towards electronic legislation, le electronic gazetting, where the traditional printing methodology would have been in place. And here in Barbados, certainly we would want that to occur as well. And I think, Mr. President, you would notice that there are many things that have to be gazetted, and not just legislation, but you have to gazette things like all appointments, not all, but some of the appointments um, in government, and some of the even temporary appointments in government are gazetted. Not all, but some. Well, opposition Senator Caswell Franklin took issue with the amendment to the interpretation bill as he accused the government of rushing that legislation. What you are doing here is a wrong about method rather than following the normal procedure that should take place when you're going to get rid of posts in the public service. You bring them before this parliament and it is the, an order to remove the posts are an order to remove these posts is debated, but we are doing it differently this time without people getting any notice. And of course, we say hello now to our Lisa Boom in our social media corner to tell us what is trending. Good evening to you, Lisa. Good evening, Lisa, and welcome to Watch Trending. Now we start with news that a Virgin Atlantic flight from Barbados was quarantined on arrival at London's Gatwick Airport this morning after a number of passengers complained of nausea and coughing fits. Well, Virgin Atlantic officials here in Barbados have issued this release. They say as a precautionary measure, the plane was met by the relevant authorities. Everyone on board was screened in line with health and safety procedures and most of the passengers were able to disembark and continue on their journeys. But three were reportedly transferred to hospital for further attention. Now that flight was later revealed to be a private charter for Swiss cruise line MSC Cruises. And they're said to be investigating the incident. And it's Ash Wednesday today, and while many churches here spent the morning preparing for special services to mark the day, well, there was extra work to be done at one of them. This was the scene which greeted the sexton at the St. George Parish Church this morning. Six windows, including two of stained glass, were broken in an act of vandalism that happened in the wee hours. However, church officials have confirmed that they were able to hold normal services today and they say that the window should be prepared in time for mass tonight, which should have started a short while ago. The police we're hearing have a suspect in custody. Now over to the United States, where parishioners in West Virginia have also been dealing with damage at their place of worship. This time, though, it was caused by fire. Now, we're hearing that the flames were so intense at one point that the firefighters had to back away. But then when they sifted through the rubble afterward, 
Firefighters found their Bibles and crosses in the church were only slightly damaged, if at all. And all of this was despite the intensity of the flames. Well, switching now, we're still in the United States, but we're talking about something a little bit different. Singer R. Kelly is facing a number of aggravated sexual abuse charges. For his first interview since his arrest, an emotional R. Kelly sat down with CBS News. Let's take a look. I didn't do this stuff. This is not me, y'all. I'm fighting for my life. Y'all killing me with this I gave y'all 30 years of my career. Robert. 30 years of my career. Y'all trying to kill me. You killing me, man. This is not about music. I'm trying to have a relationship with my kids, and I can't do it. Well, as expected, social media has been buzzing with the release of that snippet, with many praising reporter Gail King's calm demeanor. Even Oprah Winfrey weighed in, congratulating King for doing a good job. She says she's looking forward to watching the interview in its entirety. Well, R. Kelly could be looking at between 30 and 70 years in prison if he's convicted. He's pleaded not guilty to all of those charges. And that's all the time we have for Watch Trending tonight. Send your comments to our WhatsApp numbers at 233-7388 or 233-7555. There's also our Facebook and Instagram pages. Or you can send them to our email at nca at cbc.bb. But remember to keep your comments clean. So we'll see you tomorrow for another look at Watch Trending. Lisa, I understand that that interview is going to be aired either tomorrow, either later tonight or sometime tomorrow on CBS. So perhaps you should look out for it. Come April 1st, Barbados will have the laws supporting a ban on single-use plastics. And this was revealed during a media sensitization by the Ministry of Maritime Affairs and the Blue Economy. Minister Kirk Humphrey says he expects Parliament will debate the relevant bill soon. He also says the ban is an important initiative which will positively impact the environment, including the nation's marine resources. And Minister Humphrey warns that anyone who contravenes the law will face some serious consequences. And legislation is coming to give effect to all that we've said over the last few weeks. And while I do not wish to say specifically what the penalties are, suffice it to say that these penalties are very, very, very stiff. For persons who determine that even though the government has made a decision that it no longer wishes to engage in this country, in people supplying single-use plastics, especially in the process of a trade, if people determine that they want to do it, then they will have to face the penalties of it. Now, the minister is also encouraging wholesalers and retailers of products that which will be used as alternatives not to be unreasonable with their markups. He's hoping that market forces will deter any drastic price hikes. If you raise your price by a dollar, these things are so price sensitive. You raise your price by a dollar on a dollar fifty two dollars in many ways you praise yourself out the market anyhow because many barbadians when they go to buy food ain't prepared to pay an additional two three dollars for something and the truth is that we say to them and we run the ads this container costs 30 cents more than the container you were previously using this one may cost you 10 cents more this one may cost you 50 cents more do not buy from anybody whose product has gone up by two dollars three dollars I mean, we got to be clear and fair. Regional airline Liat is set to receive some financial assistance from Grenada. The announcement by Minister of Industry and CARICOM Affairs, Oliver Joseph. He says the decision to bail out Liat follows a decision by CARICOM heads at their recent 30th intersessional meeting over in St. Kitts and Nevis. I'm pleased to announce that Cabinet at its meeting on Monday took the decision to contribute to the operation of LIAT by the end of this month. As you would have heard in the news that LIAT said if they do not get the contribution from governments, they will not be able to operate beyond 10 days.